Hey, what's up guys? Fabio here once again, and I want to welcome everybody back to another video. And today I'm going to be continuing uh, this little documentary, documentary, if I could talk, that would be a great start to the video, uh, documentary series of reviews with the other Canon Films documentary, Electric Boogaloo, and this one's called The Wild Untold Story of Canon Films. Um, I don't know why they put wild in the title. Um, I mean, I guess it was wild for the people that were there, you know, back in the 80s. But, yeah. And right off the bat, I will say that I did like the documentary because there was positive stuff in there. But, you know, most of this, I think most people out there that have talked about this documentary and reviewed it and everything, I think most of them have said the same thing, that it is very derogatory. It is an extremely derogatory documentary. Uh, the majority of the people in the in the documentary, all they really did was they talk shit about Canon, and they talk shit about Menahem Golan and Yerm Globus, and they talk shit about all these movies and how bad these movies are. These are the worst movies ever made and all this other bullshit. You know, and I'm just going to put this out there, you know, like I said in the previous video, which was the other Canon Films documentary review, you know, I'm a fan of Canon Films. Are these the greatest movies ever made in the world? No. But you know what? They're fun. You know, people are still, you know, again, look at Charles Bronson. People still talk about Charles Bronson movies. Chuck Norris movies. The movies that Stallone made with them. Masters of the Universe. The movies Van Damme made with them. Even Superman 4, as bad as Superman 4 is, people are still talking about it. So, I mean, they made it. You know, Canon Films was successful for a time, and then obviously we all know what happened. Um, you know, it was excess. It was too much money. They were spending too much money. They were spending money they didn't have. Where the money went, nobody really knows. Obviously, it didn't really go to the movies. It kind of disappeared. Um, and there was a lot of you know, inside stuff going on that people really didn't know about. There was, you know, a lot of payoffs and corruption and, you know, a lot of crazy things happened with this company. Um, a lot of things did. And I mean, yeah, the people involved with this documentary were the people there and were the people that experienced it firsthand. But again, I look at it this way. Number one, everyone got a job that was involved with this. Everyone had some kind of you know, gainful employment, whether they were a writer, a producer, a director, an actor, whoever. They worked, and you know what? They got paid, and I'm sure some of them are still getting residual checks that I'm sure are not bad money. So I really don't understand. I've never really understood that about Hollywood. You know, uh, people bitch and complain about the movie. Well, they ruined the movie and this and that. It's, it's Hollywood. That is the nature of the business. That is what happens in the business. You take a script. It's a great script. 20 other people rewrite it. They fuck it up. It's not what it used to be. And that's the movie they make because that's the movie they pay for. That's what happens. It's just, you know, if you're disappointed with why the movie wasn't a hit or not, okay, I can understand that. But I just don't get why all these years later people are still bitching and complaining about a movie they worked on 30 plus years ago, 20 years ago. Oh, it was terrible, and it was hot, and it was this, and it was that. Like, come on. You got paid. You got paid better than me. So, you know, I'm sure you're still getting residual checks. So why complain? I've never understood that. So that's really the biggest takeaway from this. Um, the positive stuff is a lot more of the footage, like different footage from different movies, so it's a better visual there. Um, one thing I forgot to point out in the Go-Go Boys, they actually show a deleted scene from Delta Force, um, which was very cool to see. Excuse me. Um, there's a scene that I guess was supposed to be at the end of the movie where the vice president comes and meets the hostages, and you see Joey Bishop talking to him. Um, and yeah, they cut that out of the movie, but they included it in the documentary, so I don't know how they got that footage, but uh, it would have been cool to see more of it. But it's in there. It's actually in the in the documentary. Um, but this one, um, you know, there is there is positive stuff. Again, some of the producers, some of the people that went on to do a New Image, like John Thompson, who was one of the producers, he actually passed away. Uh, Avi Lerner, 
you're not Avi Lerner. Avi Lerner? Um, I think he's in it. Uh, but a couple of the people from New Image, which was really like the spinoff of Canon, because they a lot of the people that started New Image worked for Canon, and then when Canon finished, they moved on. Um, so that was cool. Uh, Michael Dudikoff is interviewed. Uh, it's not much. Um, the only thing he really gets to say is, you know, they promised me this, they promised me that, you know, you're going to be Spider-Man, you're going to be Captain America, and, you know, just wait, just wait. And you could tell, like, Michael Dudikoff was a little, like, bummed out about it. And I don't blame him, I completely understand. Um, you know, these guys made you a star, and you're doing all these movies, and then they're telling you, like, other movies you're going to do. I get it, you know, I can't, I get why Michael Dudikoff would be a little you know, bummed out about that. Um, but luckily, Michael Dudikoff had a career outside of canon. I mean, he's, you know, yeah, pretty much all his movies went direct to video, but a lot of them were good. You know, I really liked uh, Bounty Hunters 1 and 2. I just watched those. I actually enjoyed them quite a bit. Um, Crash Dive and the sequel slash remake uh, Countermeasures, I like those. Uh, Cyberjack, Virtual Assassin was alright. The Cobra TV series, I did like him in that. Um, the shooter that he was in, the Western movie, I like that one. So Michael Dudikoff actually had a nice little career after Canon Films, which was cool. Um, you know, luckily, he was a big enough talent and name that he was able to continue a career. I, I'm glad, because I've always really liked Michael Dudikoff as an actor. Um, it would have been nice to see him talk more. Um, this documentary is available on Blu-ray in Germany and Australia. Uh, both versions have different extras, so I would like to get both. And there's actually a, I think like a 20 plus minute extended interview with Michael Dudikoff on one of those. So there you go. That's where all that footage went, unfortunately. But I definitely want to get that, uh, specifically to get the Michael Dudikoff interview. Um, I know a couple of them. Uh, they talk about more about Captain America and Spider-Man, and I think even there's one of them has, they talk about 10 to Midnight with Charles Bronson, um, and I think there's a couple other ones, so I'd like to actually get those because of the features, really, but yeah, um, and yeah, I mean, they again, they talk about the beginning, how they made movies in Israel, and then they came to America and bought Canon. Um, and they talk about a lot of the earlier movies, which were more like artsy fartsy, you know, kind of stuff. Like they talk about Bolero with Bo Derek, which was basically a porn film. I mean, it was a classy porn film. Um, there was just a ton of nudity, a ton of sex in it. Um, when it came out, uh, they had a deal. Canon had a deal with MGM to release movies at the time. And that was the movie that killed the deal. Because they wouldn't cut stuff out of the movie. They kept adding more sex and more nudity. And it was... When it came out, it was unrated. Like, they were saying you had to be, like, 18 to go see the movie. They would not let anyone in under 18. And, yeah, and it, it was it was bad. And it looks like, To be honest, it looks like a bad movie. I mean, you know, Bo Derek, yeah, she was a sex symbol back in the day. Because of 10 and, and this movie and... It just looks like a movie that I wouldn't want to watch. But when they started doing more, like, you know, Enter the Ninja was like the first action movie they did. And Enter the Ninja was successful. Um, they talk about that. They talk about how Franco Nero got casted. He was, he just happened to be at, I think, Cannes Film Festival or, or another film festival. And they saw him and they asked him if he wanted to be in the movie. And he was like, sure, I'll be in the movie. Um, and then... They talk about how they dubbed his voice because he was supposed to be American and Franco Nero is not American. He's Italian um, and he has a very distinguished accent. So they had to dub him. It sounded nothing like him. And yeah, you know, it's a pretty funny story. But I still really like Enter the Ninja. It's a fun movie. Um, then they talk about Revenge of the Ninja, Ninja 3, how it was weird and stuff like that. And then they talk about American Ninja, which was cool. So they talked about the Ninja movies, which was nice because I'm a big fan of those movies. I still love all the Ninja movies they did. Um, then they talk about Chuck Norris, how Missing in Action came about, how there was two different movies. 
one was better than the other, so they flipped them, and, and that story, and how, you know, Chuck Norris wanted to be taken more seriously and do different stuff, and how they work with them. Uh, they talked about Delta Force, which was nice, um, and they talked about Van Damme a little bit, mostly about Cyborg. They really didn't talk about Bloodsport, but they talked about how Van Damme went in and re-edited Cyborg, which he did the same thing on Bloodsport. Um, you know, they talked about, of course, Superman 4 and the disaster that that was. Uh, and they talked about, of course, the highs and the lows and, you know, where the money went and, and the, you know, the the money laundering stuff with that came out later. Um, they talk about when they went off on their own and they were competing, like they did the Lombada movies. Like they had two movies, like one was called Lombada, the other one was called The Forbidden Dance. They opened on the same day at the same theater, which was weird. Um, and they were, you know, trying to outdo each other. And then 21st Century Films, which Menahem Golan went to, that failed. And then Canon just eventually closed its doors they just couldn't make any more movies they ran out of money you know and there you go um but yeah most of the people again just all they wanted like okay bo derrick okay they want you to be naked more and they wanted you to get fucked more on screen okay i get that i get why someone would be bitter um but another thing is you know nobody forces anybody to do anything. This is what I again I've never understood. Well, you have a contract. Well, you know there's a thing called lawyers where it's like you know what the client doesn't feel comfortable with this. Um, well, it's the money. You can make more money and you can make better money on different movies. I've never gotten that shit. Like, you know nobody puts a gun to your head and forces you to do stuff. Um, but they complained about that. Uh, the girl from Star Trek, uh, Marina uh, Sirtis, because she was in Death Wish 3 and this other movie where she was naked the whole time. And they were talking about Michael Winter and how he was a misogynist, which I believe because they talked about Death Wish 2 and the rape scene and all that, which I agree. Like Death Wish 2, number one, that was not in the script. Uh, and number two, it's just grotesque and it's disturbing and it doesn't need to be in the movie. Um Whenever I watched Death Wish 2, whether it was when I first saw it back in the day till now, I always fast forward through the rape scenes because it's disgusting. You don't need that in a movie. And, you know, I watch a lot of, you know, horror films and action movies. People are getting shot and killed and murdered. And that doesn't bother me because I know that's, you know, pretend. But when you're filming a rape scene, you kind of have to get into it. And it's it's fucked up. And I, I hate that shit. But they talked about that in there. Um, then they talked about Death Wish 3, where it was like, yeah, like, all the, the blacks and the Hispanics get murdered by these old white people, and I'm like, really? Like, really? It's a fucking movie, you know? It's just a movie. It's stupid. Um, and, uh, Lance Hull, who was Charles Bronson's, I don't know if he was his agent, but they worked together. And he said, he goes, you know, I, I don't think Charlie liked making those movies. I don't think he liked making the Death Wish sequels because they were, you know, super violent and all this. And he goes, I don't know why he did it. Well, I know why he did it because he got paid. But um, I don't know if, if, I mean, Charles Bronson, unfortunately, has been gone for many years now. So we'll never get to know his side of the story. Um, but I don't know if, if Charlie didn't like those. I mean, obviously... There had to be another reason besides the money, you know, to make them. I don't know. Um, but, yeah. And Alex Winter, you know, uh, Bill from Bill and Ted, he even said that. He goes, you know, that's why he was there at Canon because, you know, he was from the old Hollywood and he still wanted to be in the movies and, you know, Hollywood didn't want him. So that's why he made these movies. And, again, I don't know if that's true because – you know, Charles Bronson was a huge star, you know, from the Death Wish to the other movies that he made. You know, people still to this day know who Charles Bronson is. Um, but I think maybe, you know, he liked Golden and Globus. I don't know. I really don't know. Um, you know, I'm sure the paychecks were good, you know, until he passed away. Um, you know, but I'm sure that he had to have some kind of fun. I don't know. Again, Charlie Bronson's been gone many years. We'll, we'll never get to hear his side of the story. But, yeah, I think he just liked to work. You know, I think he liked doing movies. And, and he knew what 
people liked with him and that I guess that's why he still did them because he knew that his fans wanted to see him, you know, kill all these bad guys. I don't know. I really don't know. Um, I hope that's what it was, but yeah, they talked about that. Um, they talked about when, um, they signed Stallone, like they signed Stallone for $12 million, which in the movie or in the documentary, they're like, whoa, some say it was 20. Some say it was actually 12. Um, Stallone signed because they talk about over the top, but he also signed for Cobra. It was twelve million for both movies, um, which again they neglected to talk about in the documentary. They completely ignored Cobra in the documentary. They didn't say anything about Cobra, but they talked about over the top and how it was the the writer who was also the writer for Death Wish Two. He was like, I cried at the movie at the premiere because I knew my career was over because the script was completely different, and the movie sucked, and blah, 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 whatever. Like, come on, man. Over the Top is actually a really good Stallone movie. I think why it didn't do well when it came out is because Stallone was known for Rocky and Rambo. Um, Cobra made a bunch of money, but they didn't talk about it, of course. But Over the Top, but see, Cobra was shooting and killing and blood and guts, you know. And Over the Top was a little more drama, and they were like, whoa, they made it about arm wrestling because they wanted to have an arm wrestling craze and they wanted to make the first arm wrestling movie that everybody would copy them for. And I'm like, this is so stupid. These these people are idiots. They don't know what they're talking about. Um, but they did talk about Over the Top, which was nice, even though it was derogatory. It's like, oh, wow, this movie gets some appreciation. Um, and then, uh, the what the hell's her name? Uh, Laureen Landon... She burned her copy of America 3000. That was the worst fucking movie ever and blah, blah, blah. Well, okay, I'm pretty sure it's a bad movie. I've never seen it. I've never really heard of it, but no one knows who she is. Lorraine Landon was in Maniac Cop 1 and 2, and she died five minutes into the second movie. Nobody fucking cares about her. Um, but yeah, that was stupid, in my opinion. Um, and then they talked about uh, just how they thought, you know, Canon, they thought they were like this big company and they really weren't. And they were making all these big prestigious movies. And I think that's one of the big reasons what hurt them was that they were trying to make like these big Academy Award winning movies and it just wasn't going to happen at that time. In the 80s, you know, I mean, in the 80s, it was a little more looser, a little more freelance, but nobody, unfortunately, was going to take them serious. And I think the reason why is because they were Israeli and they were Jewish. And Hollywood, for whatever reason, is still very anti-Semitic. Um, I don't know why they have such a disdain for Jewish people. I really don't. Um, but I think that was, you know, why people didn't like them, is because they were prejudiced. And they were ambitious, I think, because they had these big dreams and they wanted to make all these big movies people were kind of mad at that um in the 90s it definitely calmed down because you saw less independent stuff and more studio stuff and now you know i think that canon definitely left their mark because i think a lot of filmmakers now grew up on these movies and especially independent movies now they're definitely done in the canon style you know the way that they're made they're quick they're done they're out they're you know, the budgets are small. You know, they definitely influence a lot of people. Um, but I think the biggest mistake that they made was they just got too greedy. You know, they were they were spending more money than they were making. They were spending money that they had no access to. That's when they came under investigation. They talk about that. But they didn't really, like, go in-depth to it. Um, they talk about, you know, when Peretti got busted because he was... Uh, laundering money to the mafia and all this. Um, you know, I think that was the, the downfall was they got too big for their britches. I think what they should have done, and this is just me, I think they should have just kept making little action movies like the Charles Bronson movies and the, and the Chuck Norris, keep the budgets low and the quality better. And I think that would have kept them going. You know, those were the movies that were really popular. I think their highest grossing movie was Missing in Action, the first one you know, um, that they did themselves. Cobra made money, Bloods but Warner Brothers released those. You know, they were canon movies, but they weren't released by canon. Um, but I think if they would have stuck to that, you know, and worked a little, like Superman 4, Superman 4 could have been a good movie if they would have just worked better on it. 
well, they cut the budget in half. But you can work around that. You can cut back and do different things. Um, you know, if they would have just did that, I think, I don't know if they'd still be around today, but they would have been around, a, like, you know, a couple years past what they ended. I mean, I think they officially closed their doors in 1994. Um, the The last couple movies they did were Hellbound with Chuck Norris, uh, Street Night with Jeff Speakman, American Ninja 5 was one of the last ones, uh, Chain of Command with Michael Dudikoff. Um, 1994 was the last year they were around after that they were done um, but yeah if they would have you know gotten their finances in order and just made little action movies little movies like that I think they could have stayed around a couple more years um, you know if they didn't you know I will make 30 million dollar movies and I don't know what to do That's that was the problem when they got really big and they were promising people all this stuff. Like, again, Michael Dudikoff, you know, you're going to be Spider-Man. You're going to be Captain America. Let's work on the movie we're working on now. Let's work on American Ninja. And when we're done with American Ninja, then we'll go to the next one, you know. And they were, they were yeah, they were basically making movies and getting them out and not caring. And that's what happened. When they got greedy and complacent and they were, they were working on five, six, seven movies at once, you know, it, it, gets to be a problem you know and that was the 80s i mean it wasn't just canon that did that there were plenty of companies whether they were movies or whatever where you know they were spending too much money they were probably doing too much cocaine i don't know um i wasn't there but you know that's what happened but i mean again there is some positive stuff in this documentary you know there's some positive comments the one that i really didn't get was i forget who it was but you know, some someone said, well, Canon was like Miramax, the Weinsteins, but the Weinsteins actually made good movies. I don't know about that, because Miramax put out a bunch of shitty movies as well. And Harvey Weinstein can fucking die. Um, but yeah, you know, they were really the last big, like, independent on their own company. I mean, after, after the, you know, the 80s, you know, yeah, I mean, there would be independent companies, but they were doing little movies. You know, they weren't doing, like, canon, big, you know, Chuck Norris, Sylvester Stallone type movies. Um, so they were really, like, the last big independent movie company that kind of made its mark a little bit. Um, you know? But at the end of the day, I do like the documentary for what it is. I just wish that people would have been a little more positive. Um, the good thing is there, a lot of the, the deleted scenes from this have ended up on different Blu-rays, like, uh, the Death Wish 2 Blu-ray has some extended interviews, uh, Cyborg with Van Damme has some extended, so a lot of that footage ended up getting used elsewhere, which is nice, and like I said, uh, the two Blu-rays that are out, one in Australia, one in Germany, have different extras, so I would like to get both to have the features, um, but I know one of them has like a 20 plus minute interview with Michael Dudikoff. So I definitely want to check that out. Um, they talk about Spider-Man and Captain America and some of the other movies. So I look forward to, to that kind of stuff. But yeah, I mean, I recommend it if, you know, if, if you like these movies like I do, you know, check it out. You know, Joe Bob says check it out. I'm sure he would say that as well. Um, it's not bad, but it could have been better. It could have been more positive. You know, I just don't understand why people are so bitter, you know, I just don't get it. But anyway, I hope that you guys enjoyed my review of Electric Boogaloo, and I will talk to you guys later. See you.